It's a tale as old as time, Roy, the real estate hustle in Florida. And most recently, of course, we experienced during the pandemic a kind of a gold rush, if you will, of people coming from New York, Chicago, the West Coast to move to Miami. It's what everybody wanted to do, get a piece of the of the Florida dream. And of course, that's when the <laughs> that's when the schemers and scammers and hustlers and con men uh, come out of the woodwork. But enough about Mayor Francis Suarez. Oh, wow. What we are talking about is the self-proclaimed king of Coconut Grove, one of Miami's most popular neighborhoods, also the oldest neighborhood. West Grove is the oldest neighborhood in Miami. It, in fact, predates the the incorporation and, and founding of the city. It was made up mostly of uh, Bahamian immigrants who came here and literally built the city of Miami and found themselves on the founding documents of the city of Miami. City of Miami is one of the few cities in America that was founded by, I don't want to say a majority of, but predominantly people of color on the original documents of the city, thanks to this neighborhood, Coconut Grove. Well, it's obviously been ripe for opportunity and redevelopment by all kinds of uh, uh, predators, both legit and illegit, including this guy, Doug Cox, and his wife, uh, who is an attorney. And they started developing about 20, almost two dozen lots, maybe about a dozen homes, built these what appear to be very beautiful, nearly finished uh, houses that were selling for well over a million dollars. And they started taking deposits on him, Roy. And they kept taking deposits on him on the same houses, sometimes two, sometimes three, at least one. They quadruple sold, allegedly. <laughs> and, and what was happening, of course, during this time, Roy, is that the value was going up. So what was happening was he's like, well, I don't want to sell this thing for $1.2 I want to sell this thing for $3 million. So he kept, you know, <laughs> re, you know, canceling a sale, not refunding money, um, reselling it for a higher price, people putting down a higher down payment, telling buyers allegedly, oh, we'll be ready to move in in 45 to 60 days. And if you see these houses, Roy, you'd believe it. They, they appear like they're pretty far along in the process. And you, wound, and you wound up with a whole lot of buyers getting good and screwed. You wound up with... This guy's got partners and investors um, and people who loaned him money getting screwed. Uh, the, we're talking about what has been alleged uh, by one of his former, Doug Cox's former partners, as being uh, a Ponzi scheme, is what he claims in a lawsuit, and saying that this guy allegedly defrauded his investors and defrauded his buyers. One of those buyers is a refugee from New York City who moved down with his family during the pandemic to find, you know, to live his Florida dream, to find a better home and a better life. Uh, Michael Coyne is one of the few people who, through this process, has not agreed, like some of the other buyers had, to kind of settle for whatever pennies on the dollar they can get. Uh, he's decided to fight this thing to what will no doubt be the bitter end. And Mike, basically, in, in my opinion, he bought the the VIP Miami simulation. He has gotten like the full Miami, like the full Miami, I should say the full hashtag because Miami VIP experience. He's getting hustled by real estate people. He's gone to the city of Miami for help. You know, you know what happens there. Nothing. And, and this is a developer, Roy, who I hope you're sitting down. And if you're not, you should stand up and sit down again just to re re make sure you're sitting down when I tell you this. This developer donated $200,000 to no. Mayor Francis Suarez, who always no. says, How can I help no. myself? So needless to say, Mike Coyne did not get a lot of love from the city of Miami. He is joining us now on the Because of Miami podcast. I mean, welcome, and I'm sorry, bro. I mean, you didn't call me. for If you were doing due diligence, you really, I should have been your first call, and I would have said, don't invest in the city of Miami. Maybe you want to look at other municipalities, unincorporated Miami-Dade, but you do not want to be in the city of Miami. You're going to want to invest your money in in a in a city with a more stable government and in regime. Broward. Like Caracas is what I was thinking, for for, for Christ's sake. But, uh, Caracas, yeah. Mike, what happened? What were you thinking? I mean, you... <laughs> You, you, what was your, I should say, what was your plan? What was your dream? Because you have a, a big family, you have like in-laws, like you were going to make a big life change down here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right, Billy. I came down as a New York refugee, although my wife and I had been planning it for a while. Uh, and that was sort of 
uh, more than the straw that broke the camel's back, but certainly um, COVID had a lot to do with it. Um, when we moved down, it was my wife, Oksana. We had a, a, a one-year-old son and my mother-in-law lived with us. Um, in January of 20, so we moved down in 21. In January of 22, found out Oksana was pregnant with twins. Wow. Congratulations. So it, it, it was sort of like, okay, well, us jamming into an apartment with Brickle is going to be challenging. Uh, we need a house. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the war broke out. Uh, my father-in-law, um, for a time, came to live with us, uh, has has since gone back. Uh, but we needed space. They're, they're, um, they're so, Ukrainian, I take it. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, so we started looking. Um, and we, you know, it was a crazy time. You remember, I mean, you, you'd bid full offer on a house and then someone else would, uh, would bid higher and you'd lose it. Um, and eventually we found this on one of the, the you know, Zillow's or one of those websites. Um, we went in, it was very quick. Um, it was almost done. This was uh, March of 21. Um, we offered full asking, which for us was one, six and a quarter. It was a five, five and a half, put down the 30%, just under 500 grand and locked an interest rate at, uh, in the threes, I think, um, 45 days to close ish. June 15th was the outside date. Uh, that was June 15th of 21. And I imagine you're, you're, you've moved in, you're living happily there with your in-laws and your family and, and all is a happy ending. I thought about squatting, uh, (laughs) just, 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 you know, because I mean, I mean, you laugh, but the city and this the this incestuous business, um, political business environment in Miami, um, and that includes uh, the judicial system, um, uh, uh, you know, bureaucrats in the government, politicians, obviously the business community. They don't give you much choice but to break the lock and just go, you know, throw me out because we've basically tried everything else. So let me ask. There was never a certificate of occupancy. The, the the construction never finished. It went on for years. I don't know how many times uh, uh, Cox sold your particular uh, property or, or your house, but um, what I mean, what ultimately happens here? How much money have you lost so far? What is the state of things? I mean, here we are three years later. You obviously, I was being facetious earlier. You did not move in. You've never taken possession uh, of the house, and you've never seen your deposit again. Yeah, that's correct. So um, when when the when this went into a receivership, which it is now, and it 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 started over a year ago, they asked us for uh, a claim of damages. So it's it's hard to calculate, but um, obviously the the real estate markets moved uh, away from us um, by certain uh, calculations. This house has seen one hundred percent appreciation. I don't know if that's true anymore, but it's significant. Uh, interest rates are bar- borrowing at at over double, um, and you know there's basically very few houses left to buy. I had some employees that I wanted to move to Miami that got put on a hold. A lot of short term rentals. They're they're very expensive. You know, moving around, storage costs, um, and then obviously the the emotional toll um, on our family. Uh, you know, it's it's it pushed puts pressure on the marriage. Um, it, it put pressure on, you know, my wife's relationship with her parents. It's tough for the kids. You know, you're trying to find these short-term rentals in Miami for, you know, six people. It's it's nearly impossible. So, I mean, the financial damages are in the millions, you know, legal fees. Um, and then, you know, just the amount of time, Billy, like, I mean, you know, I talked to you for an hour on Monday. I'm doing this now. Um, I mentioned to you, I work for myself. You know, you're for three years plus now, we've been putting a lot of time uh, and effort into that. And I don't know how you quantify that. So you, at some point, finally, the building department run by Ace Marrero, a guy who has been credibly accused in multiple lawsuits of being part of an alleged conspiracy to target 
Leroy, you remember the ball and chain owners. We've talked a lot about that litigation against Joe Carollo. He's now being sued in his individual capacity amongst other uh, department heads in the city for being part of, of that effort to violate the constitutional rights of these private business owners. The building department had not been very helpful here until they finally came in, issued a stop work order. Roy, you're going to love this. This guy had submitted plans, this Doug Cox, for two-story houses, and then he built a bunch of them three-story. These are plans that were never submitted to the city, never approved by the city. He figures like, oh, I'll beg forgiveness, not ask permission. That's sort of the motto of development in, in Miami. But they, they finally did come, the city, and issue a stop work order, and then they never enforced it. The guy kept working, apparently. He kept continued construction, despite the fact that the city told him to stop. And incidentally, there was any number of things the city could have done and intervened. And if he continued to ignore the city, it's possible they could have taken, beyond fines and legal action... It's not inconceivable that there was that he was breaking laws that he could be arrested for at some point. But there's all sorts of things they could have done, but they did nothing. So, Mike, what happens? You go to the city. You ask uh, for a meeting with, um, you know. With Mayor Francis Suarez, like, I mean. Mr. Mayor, you're brilliant. You were super smart. What what happens? What does the city tell you? What are they doing? Because you're a part, you're now in the stew of the incestuous cesspool of corruption that, that so, like, you're in it, dude. Like I said, this is the Grand Theft Auto Vice City full simulation here. So what happens? You go to the city for, for relief or at least to alert them of what's going on here. Yeah, so um, just to give you some more context, um, we were supposed to close, like I said, June 15th of 22. Um, Oksana was going to give birth to the to the twins that summer. We came up here to uh, New England, where I'm where I'm from, to be with some family because we didn't have a place to live. Um, and we said, you know, we're going to move into the new house soon. And the kids are small. Like, you know, we were we were agile. We could move around easier at that point. Um, you know, June 15th comes and goes. You know, my broker's calling him. I'm calling him. Um, and finally, we had our first argument, which was probably August, September of that year. Um, and then around Thanksgiving, I said, look, I'm, I'm sick of your shit. I'm flying back down there and you and I are, are going to talk. Cox takes me through the house. He'd actually made some progress on it. He was a very apologetic, you know, the COVID excuse, the city, all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyways, um, but things just continued to spiral. So at, at one point we started contacting, um, I think it's John Porfiri in the city, um, some other folks in the city, and we started to get in touch with other buyers. Everybody was in the same situation. Others for years had been contacting Suarez, city officials. Uh, they just ignore you or do nothing. So eventually we all band together. Um, and well, 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 there was an NBC News story released in September or October of 22. Um, all these nefarious activities continued as if it had never been released. Um, we get we get we get in touch with Lin Linda Robertson from The Herald. Um, a couple of us go on record, including myself, because um, that was a key part to this to put some names out there. Apparently, it's. You know, something I guess the Herald requires to give it legitimacy. Um, and that that gets published. And I send a letter to Mayor Suarez with a bunch of big shots in you know state attorney general's office, city officials, politicians, whoever I can put on there. And we get a meeting with him um, and with um, these bureaucrats from um, the building department. So to come to your question now, we finally get face to face with Marrero. Uh, Suarez is sitting right next to me. Um, of course, the first thing he says is this happens everywhere. Um, <laughs> so this isn't an only in Miami thing. This is this happens everywhere. Yeah. Sure. Uh, that's what I'm told. Um, and yeah, Marrero's there, a couple other um, fairly senior people from the city. Uh, and then some of Suarez's assistants. Um, and. But eventually, we're, we're in there for a while. We start talking through it, and there's this sort of informal working group put together. And we're like, all right, this is great. Suarez, he's on the hook now. We, and by the way, I didn't know. I was much less educated on Miami than I am now. I didn't know about all this other shit that he had going on. And um, 
he leaves the meeting. There's a couple of us, Marrero, a few other people. Uh, well, it turns out that, and they said to me, please stop contacting other senior folks about this. I said, sure, if you guys, I don't give a shit. I just want the house. Um, so uh, long story short, they didn't do what they said they were going to do. Um, they became difficult to get in touch with. Um, when we followed up with records of certain requests from law, is what they call it, their legal people, they were uh, completely difficult to deal with. Um, it would not provide these records. And it just went into one of those sort of abysses where basically nothing came out of it. Um, you got ghosted everyone- by the city of Miami government. You got ghosted by the people who are supposed to be there to help you. Is that right? That's right. Okay. That's right. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, listen, if you got a bag, I know a man. I mean, Doug Cox has, has dumped, what is it? I, according to Linda Robertson in the Herald, two hundred thousand dollars into uh, Francis Suarez's lap. I don't know what vig he got on that because I understand he got some some uh, predatory uh, loans. It sounds like uh, uh, here reportedly. But um, let me ask you: What do you hope to happen here? Because I've got sourcing that tells me that there is apparently a federal grand jury here in the Southern District of Florida looking into this chicanery. Um, the spe- you know specifically what. Uh, what you've experienced here. Um, what do you hope to happen? Are you looking for indictments? Are you looking to get a house for the for the amount of money that you expected to pay for it in 2021? That seems unlikely. Like, what are you hoping happens here? Well, mind you, you know, we could talk about this for hours. There's a lot of stuff that has gone into this, but, you know, we've collectively talked, you know, filed police reports against Cox and his partner, Pearl, uh, who he had physically abused, according to a police report. I mean, this guy's a piece of shit like you've never uh, met in your life. Um, and by I'm, the way, I'm from Miami, Mike. I, I don't know. Okay, I've never met any anybody like him. Uh, um, but but in mind you, um, Billy, that he there's documented cases of nefarious activity by Cox for decades. People reporting stuff to the city that him and his partner Pearl were doing. So we filed the police reports. We filed. We've. Um, We've um, filed a report with um, the Florida Bar. Um, we've spoken to the state attorney general's office. The FBI has contacted certain people, not me. I have not wow. spoken to the FBI. Um, what you know? What do I want? Well, yeah, I want to see Cox and Pearl in prison. Um, and but there's a lot of people who need to be held accountable in the city in the mayor's office. Um, this receivership's a complete and utter joke and failure. It's a total good boy, good old boys thing where they're handing out money to their friends. Um, and I can get into that if you'd like, but you know, ultimately what, what I want, um, is the house at my freaking contracted price. That's it. And, And you know what, if they never did this goddamn receivership, which is a total disaster, um, I offered to negotiate with them a, over a year ago, knowing that I might have to pay a premium because there's so many creditors. And I was willing to do that. And if they had just done that with everybody, um, they could have saved millions and millions of dollars. But like you told me on Monday, Billy, and you're absolutely right. Well, if they did the smart and ethical thing uh, and the business savvy thing uh, for us, they wouldn't have collected millions of dollars for themselves and their friends. So Miami is a verb. Mike, and you got the shit Miami out of you, uh, and and apparently you still you still are. Uh, I want to continue this conversation as the the situation progresses, which I've no doubt uh, that it will. From what I'm hearing from my sources, I want to leave everybody with this though. Kevin Ware is another one of the buyers slash victims of this alleged uh, Ponzi scheme, and uh, his quote to Linda Robertson in the Miami Herald: "This guy was a, a Chicago refugee." During the pandemic, and he said, quote, everyone always says Miami is a dirty, dishonest, double dealing place. Now I've experienced it firsthand. I love Miami and I'm not leaving. But holy crap, the corruption is unbelievable. Here's a guy from Chicago. Mike, here's a guy from New York. And they're saying, like, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. And that is because the only thing that is transparent here in Miami, Mike, is the corruption. 
So I'm again, I, I said this in the early, in an earlier segment to somebody else, like, I'm sorry that on behalf of Miami, I'm sorry this happened to you. I'd like to thank you, however, for paying your fair share of the corruption tax that keeps the lights on uh, here uh, in this city. Um, and uh, I hope to uh, to talk to you soon. Mike Coyne, thank you. Thanks, guys. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, consummate populist, man of the people, always looking out for us hardworking uh, Floridians. You know, he's vetoed programs that would have pumped $346 million in federal money directly to Floridians to help us replace and upgrade our old ACs and heat pumps to reduce our energy bills. He vetoed that. He vetoed a $5 million program to fund groups working to end community gun violence. Passed by the legislature, boom, he vetoed it. This year, he vetoed all of the state's $32 million in art and culture grants. That impacts thousands of jobs and estimated billions of dollars in economic impact. Vetoed it all. He vetoed $205 million in stormwater, wastewater, and sewer infrastructure projects just as as the flood has come and surged upon us here in the state of Florida. He has done nothing about inflation, Florida, particularly Miami, the inflation capital of the United States. He's done nothing about our record high insurance prices here. That is when you can get insurance because insurance companies are cutting and running and fleeing the state of Florida, the free state of Florida, mind you, um, where nothing is free, by the way. Uh, And of course, the skyrocketing cost of living. Rent is too damn high and it is highest and growing, exploding, I should say, faster here in Florida and particularly South Florida than anywhere else in the country. But never fear, because Governor Ron DeSantis is here to help. He came down to Fort Lauderdale last week and presented an $8 million check to a billionaire. Another move in support of the future Miami Freedom Park has been made. Before Thursday night's game, Governor Ron DeSantis awarded $8 million to Miami-Dade County solely for infrastructure around the stadium. Our role, I think, as the state government uh, is not necessarily, you know, to give money to, to a team or, or, or do this, but to just create an environment where everyone can be successful, and whether that's in education or other things, but infrastructure is a big part of that. Comunista! Comunista! Socialism for billionaires. What the hell? And where all... did they get that money, Billy? Where they from, from from you and me, Roy. That's where they got that money. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about infrastructure. He means because they because he means we have to pay to clean up their mess. Jorge Moss and David Beckham got a 99-year, no-bid, below-market value lease on the city of Miami's largest piece of contiguous real estate. In fact, what was our largest green space or park in the city? Mind you, it was a golf course, but nonetheless, that's what it was. They get this deal, not for a soccer stadium, but for a whole major duty development, of which Jorge Mas has no experience. He's not a developer. He's never built a hotel or a shopping mall or an office complex or uh, any of this retail crap. He's going to sublease it out to other people. And in fact, the city of Miami is going to be one of their first tenants because they're going to build new office buildings for the city on the property and lease back our own land at what will no doubt be above market rates. The whole thing was a crazy heist from the very beginning. And yet here we are giving $8 million because they're going to totally destroy. They, By the way, not only did Jorge Mas lie, lie, by the way, he's a liar and a sports welfare queen. He lied about that this was all going to be privately financed, no public money, okay? But one step further, he hid a traffic impact study. He wouldn't release it publicly. He kept saying, well, we're, we did one, but never released it. And now we know they're going to obviously destroy the infrastructure around there. So why shouldn't he pay to clean up the mess he's making? No, the state is going to come in. The county's going to come in. The feds are going to come in to remediate this toxic landfill that he has there and uh, oh that's bs no totally totally bs neil demoss is the author of one of my favorite books about the business of sports it's called field of schemes 
How the Great Stadium Swindle Turns Public Money into Private Profit. He is the editor of fieldofschemes.com, an amazing blog that's, that's updated almost daily. And you have to read it to believe it because sports welfare is real. And let me tell you right now, Like, when I hear about, oh, we have to stop the communist threat, there's no communist threat to the United States. The greatest threat to our way of life is crony capitalism. It gives power to the oligarchs, not to the people. It perverts the free market economy. If you you call yourself a capitalist, it completely deteriorates any semblance of a meritocracy. It destroys the American dream. And sports welfare is perhaps one of the greatest uh, sins. And, Neil, what is the economic impact? Like, what, what do we know about the numbers of how much, roughly, public money has gone in to build basically to, to subsidize millionaires and billionaires for their, their private companies? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to get a good number because as we're seeing with uh, with, you know, this deal, right, there's claims that it is uh, entirely private money, but there's the public land that's going into it. There's the eight million dollar oversized checks going into it now. Um, but it's certainly probably two, three billion dollars a year um, in terms of state money, city money, federal tax breaks, things like that, that uh, end up going into these projects. And the return on that. I think if you ask any economist in the country who's investigated it is pretty much zero, maybe a little more than zero, but pretty much zero. Um, It is absolutely the worst bang for your buck that you can find anywhere outside of, uh, I don't know, the Pentagon buying $15,000 hammers or whatever it is these days. (laughs) Well, we often hear about this, the ROI, like that these are investments in neighborhoods, in communities, in future revenue. And you see these economic impact studies that are commissioned by municipalities or states or cities or usually by the the franchises themselves, be it NFL, uh, MLS in this case, certainly Major League Baseball, uh, the NHL, NBA, and and now in some cases, amateur (laughs) or even minor league uh, teams as well are getting major duty, multi-million and billion dollar uh, subsidies. And all of these teams are usually, again, owned by people whose net net worths are, for example, $12 billion is the net worth, estimated net worth of Shad Khan, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, who just got himself, thanks to the mayor of Jacksonville, Donna Deegan, a a one point what is what is the total now? What what is it? They're saying one point three ish billion dollar one point. Okay, that says one point four, but I've seen all sorts of estimates between one point two and one point four billion dollar stadium, fifty five percent of which is going to come from the city's general fund again to subsidize a billionaire and his private business, and Neil. They have a study, an economic impact study that the Jaguars commissioned and then the city commissioned a study to study that study. Not even in in their own study, just to study the study. They claim, Neil, that there will be $26 billion in economic impact from this stadium investment. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, everybody has a study, right? I mean, uh, some of the economists who look at this are tearing their hair out. J.C. Bradbury uh, at Kennesaw State, I think, referred to them as clown studies, which is a good term. Um, I actually have a friend who used to work for a consultant that did these kinds of uh, economic impact studies. And he always compared it to the old Calvin Hobbes cartoon where Calvin was writing a paper titled Bats are Giant Bugs. And Hobbes is like, I'm not so sure about that. And Calvin says, no, no, don't worry. I'm going to get an A. I've got a secret weapon. I've got this clear plastic binder that I'm going to put it in. Teachers love that. And that's what these studies are, right? You know, the numbers are complete garbage. They're about as relevant as bats or giant bugs. Um, But they're, you know, very, they're glossy. They got lots of charts. They're full color. You know, they got these, you know, uh, nice slideshows and uh, presentations. Um, And, uh, you know, economists will all look at them and say, okay, this is complete garbage. This is not even a, you know, legitimate study. Um, It's just a PR document. Um, But unfortunately, a lot of people in the media buy into it, or at least will say, well, the official study says this, but then these other economists say that, 
the truth must lie somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's not, you know, that's not the case. I mean, you know, anybody who's done any kind of independent studies has found that the the benefit of these things and the economic impact is very, very small. You're mostly just moving money around. You know, how is moving the the Jaguars aren't even moving, right? They're just going from the same stadium to the same stadium, but upgraded. If Jaguars fans are spending more there, but are spending less, I don't know, eating dinner somewhere else in town because they're eating at the stadium then how is that a net positive for the city? This does remind me of Calvin Hobbes. It reminds me of Calvin peeing on the taxpayers is what it is what it reminds me of. But it's a great point that you just made about, well, also <laughs> economic impact is different from revenue or tax revenue. or new. And you're absolutely right. Most of the money that's made is what, what they call, I think, div- like diverted revenue or diverted income. Because when someone opens, for example starts a major league soccer franchise that didn't exist before, uh, I don't suddenly have an MLS budget that just magically appears in my income stream or my bank account or my budget. It's just like, that's money that if I start spending it there, I'm not spending it someplace else. So it's not new revenue. It's just revenue that's being made someplace else. And it's instead of going to say, I don't know, a local restaurant or a local business owner, you know, a hardworking Miami or Floridian who who is struggling to make ends meet and, and cover their expenses and make their nut. It's going to some billionaire that's getting subsidized by me and all those hardworking people, regardless of whether or not, or, or irregardless, as we say in Miami, anyone ever goes and you, makes use of this uh, particular stadium. I mean, Marlins Park being the perfect example. I mean, we spent billions of dollars and we to 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 basically be in a in a race to the bottom with Tampa Bay for uh, attendance, right? And now Tampa Bay is going to spend a <laughs> billion dollars or or whatever on, I mean, it's just, it, and it never ends. Like, just when we think we've hit rock bottom, Mayor Deegan or 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 the governor of, of New York comes up with a newer, shittier deal, it seems. Yeah, I mean, economists call it the substitution effect, right? Because you're substituting spending in one place for another. And my... Favorite example of this is still from back in the 1994 baseball strike where some Canadian broadcasters went around um, to local businesses in Toronto and said, how is it affecting you? You know, the Blue Jays not playing. And they went into this comedy club and the guy there was like, it's great. We've never been so packed because people don't have baseball to watch. We wish hockey would go on strike, too. Um, So, you know, it's not a secret here, but you're absolutely right that the numbers are just getting more and more and more when uh, Kathy Hochul in New York approved a billion dollars for the Buffalo Bills uh, two years ago now it was, Um, you know, it's was, you know, an insane amount of money with no roof, no roof, with no roof. And uh, they, but since then, you know, a billion dollars is kind of the bottom line, right? You know, you now got the Bears and the White Sox talking about $2 billion. Uh, You know, it's just the numbers just go up and up and up. And it's not because construction costs are getting higher, right? It's because, you know, if if you can get the money, you may as well ask for a $2 billion stadium or a $3 billion or a $4 billion stadium, right? If you're not paying for it, then you, you know, might as well build whatever you can. Part of me doesn't blame these owners. Their job is to get the best. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their, you know, ownership group to get the best deal that they possibly can. And if you have all these politicians that are going to leave the, you know, the the safe door wide open, someone's going to go in there and 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 take that money. But I, you had made a funny point earlier, Neil, about like maybe maybe it must be somewhere in the middle. There's the people who say the economic impact is zero. There's people who say it's 26 billion. It must be somewhere in the middle. Let's look at this 26 billion dollars. This bullshit that the mayor of Jacksonville shoved down the taxpayer's throat, and like you said, a lot of the media, not all of it, eats it right out of their hands because, let's face it, they're complicit because they want the ad money and they want the access to these sports teams. And, they, you know, so so they're all, it's all like, you know, you have welfare, sports welfare queens like Greg Cody. You're goddamn right, Meatball. Who are complicit in, in all of this. But let me, give you the, let me give you the facts. Somewhere, quote, unquote, in the middle of zero and $26 billion, uh, Neil, So, of course, you know, the recent survey of over 130 academic studies shows that the direct economic benefits of stadiums don't match the mammoth amount of public money used to build them. But according to the Journal of Sports Management, the estimated city revenue generated by the Jaguars from 1996 to 2007 was a mere $36.5 million over those two decades 
So I don't know where they get off saying that over the 30 years of this new sports welfare deal, there will be $26 billion when there was only $36.5 million over 20, over 20 years. Right. Well, you hit on it before, right? You said that it's, it's the difference between economic impact and actual money, right? Economic impact is just somebody took money and handed it to somebody else in your city, which doesn't necessarily benefit the city or people in the city or any of that. Um, so, you know, what you want to care about is tax revenues, right? And if the city is spending this amount of money, is it actually going to get it back in a way that it will be able to then spend it on other community needs, right? And, um, the answer is no, almost never, you know, um, not certainly if you're spending a billion dollars or even hundreds of millions of dollars, because there just isn't that amount of money that's going to come in, in terms of new taxes. It's just not possible. Before we go, for the record, I invited to be on this program today some of the sports welfare queens from across the state of Florida, including Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, who basically worked as a, an unregistered lobbyist to push this, uh, who, who decided to bend over for Beckham and uh, push this uh, sports welfare scheme through in Miami. We invited, uh, we have a standing invitation for him and for Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, who has been just shoveling cash over to Stephen Ross as he shovels cash back to her through her political committee through so-called donations. Uh, I invited former City of Miami Commissioner Ken Russell, who was the, he was the swing vote, the deciding vote on the Mel Reese, David Beckham, Jorge Moss uh, scheme. He declined uh, to come on. Uh, I invited Miami-Dade Commissioner Kevin Cabrera, who's a very proud boy, like literally a proud boy, to come on. And he's the one who introduced this measure. He sponsored the measure for this welfare from the state uh, that R- Ron DeSantis came down and presented in the form of a giant $8 million uh, ceremonial check to a billionaire. Uh, he refused to come on. And, of course, Jacksonville Mayor Donna Deegan. If this is so defensible, Neil, if these are such important projects that help the community, why don't they come on to to defend it and answer real questions about it? You know, they don't have to, right? I mean, we're back to the journalism again and the fact that, uh, you know, politicians and Billionaires and everyone has really become accustomed to the idea that the news is not going to have the time to investigate their claims, right? You know, everybody's out there, has to write eight stories a day. Um, you barely have time to copy and paste the press release. Um, so, you know, you, if you can get away with not answering questions, of course you're going to not answer questions, um, which is why it's, you know, great when people do take the time like this show to, you know, actually sort of try to investigate it. And, you know, like I try and do on my website to try to say, okay, at least I can, in the time I have in the morning, you know, when I'm writing up my blog, um, try and at least ask the questions um, for, you know, how is this going to benefit anybody? How is this going to actually work out? What is the actual, you know, financing plan? Um, because all too seldom, you know, all too often, and that's not ass at all. And how can you defend the indefensible, which is ultimately what I think they can't, uh, th- the reason why they don't uh, speak out about it beyond sports media press conferences who, don't exa- who aren't exactly equipped to a- ask the best questions about this. Neil DeMoss, if you do want to get the real data and the real facts about how we are being swindled for b- 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 billions with a B of dollars a year by billionaires in sports welfare, go to fieldofschemes.com. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Summer months get crazy here, Roy. I mean, Miami just gets extra nuts, and it's been a while since we've done, like, a wheel of despair. And in the past couple weeks, we've had the mayor of North Miami get hacked with all his personal photos, which shut down the city uh, for a while. We had uh, uh, Miami-Dade Mayor Danielle Levine Cava approved a new bridge project to be built by the same company that built the FIU bridge that collapsed and killed six people. Hmm. I mean, it's just, it's it's a wheel of despair, right? So what are our topics for today? Oh, hold on. Let me dust this uh, this wheel off. (laughs) Yeah, it's been a minute. (laughs) Wipe that off. All right. uh, Here we go. I got the... uh... Oh, right here. Right there. There there it is. There is our our leaflet on famous Jewish sports legends. Yes. Some light light (laughs) reading. Sandy Koufax over here. Uh, We got accused sex pest mayor. (laughs) Okay. Um, (laughs) S&M attorney's office. Yes, the S&M attorney's office. Sure. Uh, Yeah, having a lot of fun over there. Uh, (laughs) Another First Amendment lawsuit. Another First Amendment lawsuit. 
another First Amendment lawsuit. An- is that all caps? Another First Amendment lawsuit. Okay. Yeah, so it's all caps. Yeah, okay. You see the caps there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, lifeless wallet. I think it's called Life Wallet, Roy. Well, there's no life left in that wallet. We have biometric technology. Not a single ounce of cash in that wallet. <laughs> and uh, it looks like mine, actually. Building bridges. Building bridges, yeah. All right, here we go. Another First Amendment lawsuit. In the last month, Roy, appeals courts have allowed not one but two First Amendment lawsuits, federal suits against the city of Miami to move forward. First up is the lawsuit from comedian Hannibal Burris, who was falsely arrested in Wynwood a a few years ago um, after a night of drinking, which is what one does at night in Wynwood. Uh, But you had this cop, uh, and this cop had actually been caught on video months before he arrested Hannibal in 2020, drunkenly attacking and choking a man for no reason after drinking Fireball Tito's Vodka and Sierra Mist cocktails at the Kendall Ale House with another cop, Adrian Santos, who was later caught on video allegedly snorting cocaine at the Eleven Strip Club and, <laughs> and thrown out by bouncers. This is like the it's like a Miami Mad Lib, this story, but good for Hannibal for standing up for his rights and that case is moving forward. Also moving forward is a lawsuit filed by former Miami Police Chief Art Acevedo against the city and what he calls the three-headed monster of corrupt commissioners Joe Carollo, Manolo Reyes, and Alex Diaz La Portilla, who's already been arrested uh, for bribery and uh, money laundering, and city manager Art Noriega. Uh, for wrongful termination and for it's a whistleblower lawsuit. They violated his First Amendment rights. So, I mean, the city of Miami is just like it's like a third world uh, banana republic uh, dictatorship. In God we trust. That really wasn't the card I wanted to put. Let's just move on. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's just as Carollo. I mean, you had to play one of them. <laughs> S&M Attorney's Office. All right, this is going to be a how it started, how it's going headline. The first headline is Women are Sex Objects in Sadomasochistic Novel by Man Hired to Train Miami Prosecutors. So you might recall there's been a whole lot of uh, controversy lately and scandal in the Miami State Attorney's Office, which we've covered quite extensively. But what they did was to help, uh, I guess, handle that, they hired a guy who is the author of a book called Death Penalty Desires, Passion, Lust, and Murder, which is an R-rated self-published novel in which he, quote, explores a woman's desire for submission as she stands accused of being the infamous sex toy killer, end quote. So according to the Miami Herald, it is, quote, full of crude sexual violence, including descriptions of a transgender person as a man beast, a mutilated crotch, and it depicts female characters as having an intrinsic need to submit to a masculine man. Uh, Prosecutors in the book are craven and corrupt, and one character is found murdered with a sex toy lodged in his anus, and a horse tail is attached to it. I'm just, I'm glad I said all of those words, so... So in my future run for Senate, someone can just play play that video clip. A horse tail, huh? <laughs> that's where that's that's that was your takeaway, Roy. I mean, you know, I, I, like I, that just uh, that's not a very good image. Uh, like, that's not a very good image. I mean, you know, it's not. Sea biscuit over here. <laughs> <laughs> Madre Dios. Oh. Do we do we have time for one more? Just to get that image out of my head, yeah. Lifeless Wallet. Our friend, former Miami Hurricanes NIL sugar daddy, John Ruiz. His company, uh, Life Wallet, also known as MSP Recovery. Um, I got I got bad news for you, Roy. Um, I don't know if you you invested all your money in Life Wallet stock or in Miami coin. Either way, you are ski rude. According to a filing earlier this month with the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. The company has concluded there is substantial doubt about its ability to continue as a going concern. Unless we are successful in raising additional funds, we may not be able to continue to operate as a going concern beyond the next 12 months. The company reported uh, that in the first three months of 2024, they made $6 million in revenue and reported losing 176 million dollars in revenue. Now, I was never good at that there book learning, 
Roy, and I didn't realize it was going to be math on today's program, but yeah, that is a difference of $170 million. John So I guess we're not going to get that stadium in uh, <laughs> that Hurricane Stadium in Tropical Park no. uh, in uh, Shalala's Enchanted Forest over there. <laughs> Cocaine's.